hello everyone and, and welcome to this session organized for the crowd modeling community of practice um, with a great help and support from Diego Notello. Um, I'm Annabel Molero and I'm coordinating the crowd modeling community of practice uh, together with the leaders Matthew Reynolds who is also here and Kai Sonder who is the co-leader. Uh, so I'm very happy that you are all here and I hope that you can enjoy this session uh, entitled Grid at Crowd Modeling Advances and Challenges for Regional and Global Simulation Studies. So I'm uh, very happy to present you our speakers today. So we have Yagu Ku, uh, who is the co-founder of CGIR Platform for Big Data in Agriculture and a Senior Research Fellow at IFPRI. We also have Diego Pequeno, who is the Associate Scientist and Wheat Crop Modeler at CIMIT, and Christoph Muller, who is a Working Group Leader at Potsdam Institute for Climate Impact Research, and he's also co-leading the Agrid Initiative of ACMI um, platform. Yeah. So, um, yeah, who is going to present um, Tucan, a grid-based crop modeling framework. Then uh, Diego is going to present the work he has been doing with um, grid and crop modeling advances. Uh, he will present some examples. And then at the end, Christoph uh, Muller is uh, going to present like the ACMIX uh, Global Grid and Crop Model in the comparison. GGCMY. So he's going to present some modeling activities, data, and some collaborations uh, he is carrying out. So I'm going uh, to turn over to you, Yahoo, and thanks a lot for, for being here. Hi, everyone. Yeah, my name is Zhao Ku. I'm a senior research fellow at International Food Policy Research Institute based in Washington, DC. And I, uh, my background is crop modeling. Uh, but uh, since I joined IPRI um, uh, more than 10 years ago, uh, I started using uh, DSET crop modeling system in gridded basis. And yeah, it was not easy journey uh, to make that happen because DSET was developed and used as a point-based crop model. So uh, work on data side, the software side, and also on the cluster and make it parallelized. So we, we learned over time a lot of new techniques and uh, we, we were also taking advantage of a lot of new data sets that enabled us to do that. So I want to introduce some of these things. Um, so we are calling it Tucan because uh, we, we have a kind of tradition of calling our software and, and frameworks in following the name of cute animals. Uh, so I'm calling it Tucan and one of my colleagues, Ricky Robertson, using his framework of Mink, etc. So yeah, this is just a name, uh, nothing really, really related to the modeling itself. Okay, so I'm going to talk about um, yeah, how we started, and it all started when we started using this set on Linux platform. Um, then yeah, I'll go through grid system and some data element, and I will show some recent publications using this platform. Uh, first, uh, yeah, again, we, we quickly realized uh, when we started this journey, again, more than 10 years ago, um, for some reason that I don't fully understand, uh, the running it on this set on Windows, uh, where it was developed and distributed, was really slow. I mean, it, it was not that slow, uh, but it was slow enough that uh, our global and regional simulation work was kind of uh, very slow when you'd have to do a lot of batch simulation uh, together. So when we, we tried to do it on Linux and surprisingly it worked really well, uh, the performance boost was in the order of like three to four times. So yeah, since then we only using it in Linux. And it was not easy at that time, but yeah, now it, it's really simple. I, I, I put eight lines of code. It's, it's not even code actually, just batch command. You can follow step-by-step step on your Linux computer, then you, you will get it. It, it will be automatically um, built and compiled into Linux platform. So it, it's become much easier. So I encourage everyone to start using Linux for this. Uh, another thing we were really, um, you know, we, we benefited uh, from, from this 
uh, to, to make all these things easier and to make it compatible with other system or standard grid system. Even if we run this simulation in one country, one region, or sometimes global, uh, it all starts from standard grid system and a uh, system called Cell5M. Uh, it was co-developed with uh, 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 Professor Robert Hyman and UC Davis. And, and this gives kind of unique I, uh, identifier for each grid cell, and uh, it comes with multiple resolution, and I'm using it only for the five ArcMIS resolution. And it's, it sounds so trivial and simple, uh, but it gives uh, it just yeah solves a lot of headache. Uh, so weather file, for example, comes with grid cell ID in the file name. So profile ID also has the grid ID in it, so you can quickly look at the just the number, and you can locate exactly which location in the world we are talking about. And there is a mathematical function you can also apply to convert between let long uh, and coordinate with their ID number. So yeah, it's, it's been, been uh, one of the really breakthrough <laughs> early days uh, that we, we had to do. And yeah, it's been still being used. Okay, and the cross statistics. The second question is then, okay, so where should I run this simulation? And uh, we, we have been using MapSpam database. This is uh, kind of CGIR's community-based kind of uh, uh, geospatial data product. Uh, so it rasterized crop statistics as five R community resolution globally. Uh, it comes with 42 crops. It shows pixel level harvested area, yield, and production. Um, it disaggregates subnational statistics. So you already have some benchmark yield data. You already have some ideas on how much area the farmers are growing each of those 42 crops. So it, it, it not only give you ideas of where to run the crop, it also gives you data that you can validate or, or evaluate your performance from the simulation to compare with the statistics data. And when you aggregate to country level, it also confirms national statistics. So it, it carries that um, kind of compatibility with other studies. Soil profile was another big hurdle that we had to go through. And we now have two solutions. The one is called the HC27. It's a very simple, only 27 soil profiles uh, that are representative of all those all different types of soil in the world. It's a very approximated and uh, simplified uh, stylized soil profile, but it's been also widely used in many grid simulation. Um, the, another approach is soil grid. Uh, so ETHRIC has been releasing higher, higher resolution of soil grid. And uh, several years ago, we worked with IRI uh, in Columbia University to uh, uh, take one of the versions at that time. It was about one kilometer resolution at that time, but if we aggregate to the 10 kilometer resolution and then we convert it to soil, uh, this as soil profile format. Uh, so all the data is available on Dataverse, the IPRIS data repository, and it's organized by country code. And so like for example, for Ethiopia, that's ET.soul, and then soil profile itself is identified by, again, the GRISL ID. So it, you can quickly search through the file and find the soil profile that are relevant for your location. The weather data is also, it used to be challenging, but I, I don't think it's challenging really anymore. There are lots of different sources. Uh, so for Tukan framework, I, I've been using the source called AWARE. It provides API, so you just give latitude and longitude of where you want to simulate, and you get data back uh, in this format, so it's really easy. For future, simul for future climate data, uh, you, you still need daily weather data because this set only takes daily weather data. Um, so you have to use one of the weather generator. And the one I'm currently using is called the Maxim. And this is uh, provided by CCAP's climate program. Uh, so there is a, a web page. Uh, I'm, I'm providing a link to all these uh, resources uh, that you can download the executable file specifically designed to generate this set formatted weather data. Uh, for one of CMIP5, uh, GCM, and so it's, it's been also a very useful tool. And uh, by the way, our big data platform supported to make this happen. So another thank you note for that. 
the planting date is also one of the most uh, sensitive parameters we wanted to get it right. And yeah, this is the step I go through uh, when I needed good planting date. Um, it's just quickly, so I, I start from pre-generated daily weather data for whatever uh, length of simulation I need to run. And then I, I need to get some, you know, just get some idea of when farmers plant. Is, is it March or May or September, et cetera? Uh, then that can come from secondary data set from like GeoGlam, Crop Monitor Baseline, or Sage Crop Calendar Database. And then I run simple simulation with multiple planting window before and after that uh, mean planting window. And then uh, I, I do that for all the years that I have data, weather data for, then I, I look through the data of the yield from each of the simulation. And then, yeah, I analyze that and come up with the sequence, a time series planting date for each year. Then I write them into either seasonal file or SNX or, or like simulation file for each crop and then use that as a recorded planting date. It, it sounds a little bit techy, but yeah, if you are a DFET user, it, I, I hope you, are, you can follow what I'm doing here. And the cultivars, uh, so it, it, this has been also huge science, a uh, crop modeling community's kind of um, contribution to the crop modeling, a uh, crop modeling um, community as well. So like for example, there's no central database as far as I know for all these cultivar coefficients, but at least it's, it's becoming really easy to find it. Like for example, if I just Google Tanzania, DSET, maize, PHINT, uh, one of the uh, parameters for maize cultivar coefficient, then you can find a lot of open access journal articles that po provide you different cultivar coefficient already calibrated for their study. Like for example, uh, I, I did that myself yesterday and then I, I found this study uh, providing five different representative varieties in Tanzania already calibrated based on the field data. So we can just use that in study for Tanzania. Um, and then finally, just operation side, it, it's been, um, yeah, it, 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 it's been quite challenging at the beginning, but I, I think it's another thing, it's getting easier and easier. You just have to run these sets many, many times. There's no re really magic here. Um, and I, I've, I've been taking advantage of Java's uh, multi-threading functionality that basically you can assign, Java assigns task for each CPU core automatically behind the scene. I don't have to really worry too much about it. And then whenever simulation is run, uh, and then I also program this, this uh, Java code to pick up summary the CSV file. Of, and after all the simulation is done and compile them together and do other analysis. Um, so yeah, I know a lot of uh, my colleagues are doing it R and Python and different languages. And I think as long as the programming language support multi-threading and parallelization, yeah, it should be uh, readily possible uh, in other implementation too. Uh, so I, I made a simple code uh, for just demonstrating how I'm doing in, in Java uh, in this GitHub code repository. Um, but yeah, I, again, yeah, there are many other versions of this out there. So, so finally, once I simulate everything, then it's fun time to investigate what the simulation said. And I, I've been using software called Tableau to visualize, but I, I know there are many other solutions to do this thing too. Like for example, what I'm showing here is something I did last week. Uh, I simulated three countries in Southern Africa with multiple, like 64 different types of scenarios uh, combining different treatment, uh, the variety, fertilizer, planting window, planting density, um, etc. So I, I did that for 30 years, actually it was 12 years uh, over time, and then I aggregated and visualized to see if the response from this set is reasonable. And this data is being used by my colleague at IPRI in economic modeling and trade modeling, etc. So over time, what I've been doing at IPRI is uh, using this kind of framework to estimate what will be the yield outcome, yield change, crop yield changes under different scenarios. Uh, that scenario could be climate change scenario in the, uh, like with uh, using projected climate for the future, 
or just doubling fertilizer or different types of management practice. So I provide some link to recent publication that I use this framework. And yeah, you can follow them and uh, send me any question if you have. And yeah, again, I, I, this has been, this was challenging when I started doing this 10 years ago, but it's become really easy now. So I highly encourage everyone to, if you're already using this ad, if you feel the need for making grid simulation, uh, this is a time, this is a really exciting time. Data is available, technology is available. Everyone is sharing the code. So I think uh, you will really enjoy. Uh, I, I hope everyone can take advantage of this opportunity now. Okay, thanks. Yeah, that's my presentation. Um, thanks a lot, Diego, for this uh, clear and great presentation. So now uh, is the turn for Diego. Uh, hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Diego Pequeno uh, with Crop Modeler in CIMIT. And I'm going to give a brief presentation about the, the use of gridded uh, systems to run crop models uh, in, in CIMIT. So uh, the, the outline. Okay, so the outline of my presentation is uh, I start to to show the, the system, the DSAT with crop models and the MINK system for gridded simulations, uh, uh, simulation requirements and applications, showing some examples with uh, climate change impacts on Mexico wheat production and baseline climate impact and adaptation for global and regional uh, wheat production. And then later on, at the end, uh, challenges and opportunities for gridded crop modeling. So mix system for gridded simulation. So we, we use this system that was developed in IFPRI uh, by uh, Rick Robertson and Jabu and colleagues uh, that use the decision support system for agrotechnology transfer, the DSAT. So, uh, we use uh, crop simulation models are embedded within the MIMC system, which is a global scaled gridded simulation platform for the use of crop and economic models for agriculture at uh, global scale. And the system documentation is in the IFPRI uh, webpage. So here I showed some of the requirements, some of the aspects. So it's, it's similar to what uh, Yahoo already showed. Uh, it's uh, it, it has some input data in a raster format, some of the input data and dash uh, shell using Linux. The construction of input data sets and run par parallel execution of this at on a cluster of computers. And it has two sides of uh, cluster computers, the grass side, GIS side and the DSAT side. So which one, uh, the grass GIS side process, the GIS uh, information, uh, maps and rasters, and the DSAT side uh, run, basically run the, the DSAT simulations for every single grid cell. And they are, uh, they are all in the, in the in computer cluster. Uh, they, are, they are running a computer cluster in a Linux basic rock, rocks cluster. So here, just a, a little bit uh, of the, the data behind of the simulations. So we have uh, MIGA environments that we use to define where we, we put uh, which cultivar. So we have, uh, for example, for wheat, it's crop specific. And for wheat, we have spring wheat, facultative and winter wheat. So it, uh, this uh, MIGA environment was uh, defined based on the sowing date season, the weather uh, aspects, temp temperature, precipitation, and disease pressures. And gridded weather data, we use uh, basically for the baseline uh, 30 years of simulation like from 1980 to 2010 in a half degree resolution. And for future scenarios, also the RCP is 4.5 and 8.5. And for the, for the 2050s uh, scenarios. So uh, for, for our studies, we use basically five uh, global climate models. And the, the atmospheric CO2, also we take into account that baseline, 362 ppm, 
and then it increases for RCP 4.5 and 8.5 up to 572 ppm. So sowing dates that uh, are used in these simulations are growing degree days are generated using growing degree days algorithm, searching for an appropriate growing season of a crop. And the sowing month is estimated using the FAO crop calendar and expert knowledge. And the start of the planting window was also at the start of the simulation. So this is for spring wheat and uh, winter wheat we use it basically in the northern hemisphere it's in October and the southern hemisphere is in April. So global distribution of nitrogen fertilizer also uh, specific for irrigated and for rain fed and chosen based on the FAO database and expert knowledge. So the for the soils we use the HC27 and and harmonized world soil database that uh, Javu also uh, showed in his, his presentation. He developed uh, that, and uh, it, it basically takes into account like three uh, aspects of soils to to link with the harmonized world, world soil database. That is uh, uh, three uh, soil textures, uh, carbon uh, content, and soil depth. And uh, so here I showed some, some of the, the results, some of the application of those uh, simulations, global uh, gridded simulation. Uh, the first one is a climate change impact on Mexico wheat production. So we explored the future impacts of climate change and the uncertainty on Mexico wheat production uh, use, using two approaches, uh, point and gridded simulation. So we use it for this study two with crop models and uh, two scaling methods, five uh, GCMs and two RCPs for 2050s. And then we show uh, how the climate change uh, impact uh, the production, wheat production in Mexico with warm, warmer, warming temperatures. And especially in Northern, Northwest uh, Mexico, that is the most important region and the climate change uh, is projected to to increase the to to decrease the the wheat yield uh, in response to increased temperature, regardless of the growth uh, stimulating effects of CO two. So here are the results for the point simulation. So for point simulation, uh, we show a yield impact of minus six point one percent for the RCP 4.5 and uh, minus 6.5 for the RCP 8.5. And, and similar results. So here we showed similar results with gridded simulation. So this is for rain fed, the, in the left, the 4.5. Uh, and the, on the right, the, the RCP 8.5. So we have seen here the rain fed and here is the irrigated. So it's worth to, to mention that um, more than 90% of the wheat production in, in, in Mexico is, uh, is uh, used irrig irrigation. And we found similar results comparing to the point simulation with average of minus 8.9% for the RCP 4.5 and 9.9% for the RCP 8.5. And here I show some of the new study that we developed for global using global simulations. So baseline climate impact and adaptation for global and regional uh, wheat uh, production. So we have uh, aspect of the wheat is an important component for food security in the world and global temperature is, is uh, threatening the, the wheat production by mid-century. And in this study, we tested uh, different adaptation strategies with uh, new crop genetic traits, including heat, heat tolerance, early vigor, and increased uh, late flowering, and additional nitrogen fertilizer application as an option to maximize genetic gains. 
So here's the, the baseline using the three uh, wheat uh, model, the crop seam series, crop seam and, and wheat, these sad crop models run for 30 years uh, using also the CIMIT MIGA environments and all the, the input data that I showed at a half degree resolution. So this is, um, um, uh, is a study that was uh, done after uh, Gibe Legby uh, that did the similar study with one crop model. So we included two other crop models and, uh, and in the, we compared the results and we found similar results uh, compared to her study. Uh, so here's the baseline and then I showed here in this slide the climate change impacts. And in the, in the top of the, the map in the top and then combining genetic traits already uh, improving a little bit the, the yield and then the, the effect of nitrogen as well, together with the crop genet uh, combined crop genetic traits. So we found that uh, global wheat production uh, is projected to decrease by one, minus 1.9% 1 by mid-century. But if we take uh, a look on, the, on countries, especially developing countries in Africa continent and South Asia, we found minus 15 and minus 16 percent of the decrease on wheat production by 2050. And uh, global wheat production uh, could also be affected uh, because uh, top uh, wheat producing countries such as uh, India, Russia, Australia and Pakistan are projected to have decline wheat yields as well. And of course it, it has uh, different uh, regional patterns. And in general, uh, wheat breeding with new traits is a promising climate change adaptation option. But the effects will vary among regions and specifically could be limited under rain fed conditions where water and nitrogen uh, stress limit benefits of traits for heat tolerance or vigor and delayed uh, flowering adaptations. That's what, what we have seen in, so, in some areas in the in US, in, uh, in the uh, west part of uh, US and also in parts of Russia and some other areas that you have seen uh, a lot of uh, mainly rain fed uh, wheat production and uh, water stress uh, is exacerbated and this could limit the, the effect of the, the crop genetic traits and, uh, and also nitrogen could, could uh, could improve uh, this, uh, could, in, could increase the, the yield and, and getting more benefits from the crop genetic traits. So just to finalize some challenges and opportunities for graded crop model, we have some work on simulated trait impact scenarios uh, to guide breeding towards the most effective traits and trade combination for future wheat across the world. And it helps to understand and quantify traits to improve grain yield potential, and then apply in simulation studies across global uh, growing environments. So it's also, it's been used to classify production environments based on crop physiological and morphological response to climate and soil drivers. And uh, also look forward some for some uh, spatial crop model input data improvements. So thank you. This is my presentation. Thanks a lot, um, Diego, for this presentation and for introducing some of the challenges and some future opportunities of grid crop modeling. And now it's the turn uh, of uh, Christoph Müller. Thank you. Um, yeah, so my name is Christoph Müller. I'm at the Potsdam Institute for Climate Impact Research. And uh, I'm not going to introduce uh, a specific modeling study of mine to you, but I want to introduce a project uh, that I'm co-coordinating, which is a global grid crop model intercomparison with an ACMIP. ACMIP is the Agricultural Model Intercomparison Improvement Project that you all have heard of, I guess. 
And um, yeah, as, as you already saw from the previous talks, so there's increasing interest and also an increasing capacity to run crop models at the global scale in some grid form. And um, yeah, the GDCMI project basically is, is created to, to encourage that, to standardize some evaluation efforts, uh, input data, and supply basically a community for, for um, exchange both on data and also on interpretation and, and results. So just uh, very quickly, so I will quickly talk about global scale crop modeling, um, uh, then about a few achievements and plans in GGCMI. And then as this is uh, a data conference, I understand uh, also a little bit on, on data where well, we produce data from data, but uh, we also need to have data. Uh, both previous speakers have touched upon the growing season parametrization already, which is of course the central input, but there are many more data requirements uh, that I quickly want to talk about. Um, just as a, a general motivation why we do global scale crop modeling and why doing it in several regions and by several teams that run models in their region and know the region very well and also can parameterize their model very well um, to understand what climate change means for humanity and for agricultural systems. It is also quite important to look at it globally because well, global, uh, climate change is a global phenomenon and also agriculture is a global phenomenon because it's interlinked through international markets and what happens in one corner of the earth does affect the, uh, the rest of the world as well. So we need to have a consistent perspective on, on crop performance under climate change. So you can imagine this as a standard series of how, how um, um, climate change impact modeling works in general. So you start with like simulating climate change uh, with climate models, earth system models nowadays um, that provide changes in, in uh, relevant climate inputs to crop models like temperature, precipitation, humidity, wind speed, and, and what have you. Um, that then is put into uh, crop models, and in this case, in global credit crop models, that compute then the biophysical response of cropping systems to these changes in climate. And they provide basically time series or time, time space fields of changes in crop yields for specific crops. That then can be used again in economic models as an input, and they compute then how the economic system and the agricultural land use will change in response to that, computing changes in area for production, um, in consumption, in trade flows, and in the overall yield after all these uh, uh, adjustments in the in the economic system. And as you can imagine, all of these steps have like lots of uh, uncertainties and lots of requirements that where you need to either have data or make assumptions on. And in order to do crop modeling, you already have to choose from a pretty broad set of, of climate change scenarios. You, you have to make selections, uh, which, which greenhouse gas trajectories to consider, which crop, uh, climate models to include in your ensemble, which bias correction, method to use and so on. Um, I only want to talk about this middle part today because I only have like 10 minutes and um, that's also the focus of this conference here. And besides running a crop model where you need basically all the, the information at each, each location that you're simulating, you also need to have quite some knowledge on the management system at hand. As already mentioned, planting dates is an important aspect, but also the varieties that are used fertilizer input, timing, types, irrigation system, on crop mixes. Um, there are many more aspects that need to be implicitly or explicitly parametrized in the model simulation. And then the economists also have like constraints that they can play around with. And also we as the crop models can play around with these options to understand as, as Diego laid out uh, what would be suitable adaptation measures in, in which, under which conditions and in which region of the world. Just very quickly on what GGCMI basically is. So it's, it's a relatively well, new activity in ACMAP. So ACMAP started out as basically a field scale crop modeling activity. 
and then EasyMIP, the Intersectoral Impact Model Intercomparison Project, uh, came about, and they started out with an exclusive focus on the global scale, and then basically joining forces, and that formed the Global Gridded Crop Modeling Intercomparison within these two MIPS. And as all these MIPS do, they always start out with a fast track, so uh, trying to produce papers uh, that could be cited in the AR5 of the IPCC. That fast track uh, started in 2012, I think, and, and papers were submitted and published in 2014. We had seven models contributing to that fast track activity, and um, it was focused on uh, CMIP 5 based future projections. Up to now, this produced 20 different papers, uh, so that's quite rewarding doing, doing this uh, activity. Followed by that was uh, so called phase one, which is basically a historic reproduction of, of years, mainly focusing on evaluation of model performance. There we already had 14 models contributing, 11 papers so far. And then just, just recently finalized is our phase two, which is um, um, basically an input, is a structured uh, input uh, sensitivity analysis, basically doing more than 1,400 simulations of 31 years for all crops in all locations with uh, 12 different crop models. So this produced a huge data set um, that I will talk about a little bit about that has the advantage of having very regular disturbances to CO2, that's the C, temperature, T, nitrogen, water, and adaptation. So also there's a set. And uh, basically starting now as we speak is phase three, again, uh, in, in combination with the EASMIP activities. And if you want, that's a remake of the fast track. So this time it's not CMIP 5, but CMIP 6 based future projections driving the models. Um, this time we have 24 modeling groups indicating interest in participating. We will see how many will deliver results in the end, but uh, the interest is much larger than in, in the beginning. And also we've improved quite a bit on, on the input model harmonization that we provide apart from the climate inputs. Um, the GCCMI principles are, I guess, the same as the ACME principles. So all activities are open to whoever wants to participate and has capacity to do so. It's always protocol-based simulations. So there's a document describing what input data, how to use it in which way in your model and how to process your output data, what format and so on. Um, all output that's being produced is, uh, will end up in open archives, so it is also not just available for, for the group doing it, but also to outside collaborators or foreign people who just want to use the data to do whatever they want. Um, we all are post-processing and uh, also some quality control scripting and stuff is all open source, so people can profit from what we do. And we also encourage that the crop models themselves become open source, but that of course is not really in our hands and we depend on, on the modeling groups. And uh, we try, well, we, we, we distinguish different crop model types and try to understand if some of the differences we see in the results will be attributed to, to the origins of, of the crop models. So one group is, is of course the field scale crop models as we <laughs> So in the, in the two presentations before, so DSAT is one of, one of the famous ones. And uh, in the GGCMI, we had another parallelized version of DSAT called PDSAT, uh, again, basically using the PSAT model as it is at the core and developing an environment that feeds that core with uh, the different in input data for the different locations and then merges it back to a, to a global output set. But uh, there's also two other groups where, where crop models are, are coming from, and one is the DGVM, so the uh, Dynamic Global Vegetation Models that basically come originally from the carbon cycle uh, science, uh, natural vegetation, dynamic natural vegetation uh, models that at some point increasingly started to include um, um, crop modules into their, into their model because assuming that the world consists of potential natural vegetation without any land use is quite heroic. 
And uh, so in order to do better carbon cycle modeling, these models introduced crop models. And then these became uh, also capable of doing crop modeling at the global scale. And a similar story in the Earth system models, so basically the land surface schemes of, of the big climate models, um, they also started implementing crop modules. And uh, all of these models come with specific foci on, on, on different aspects. So the Earth system models usually run at a sub-daily time scale up to 20 minutes uh, resolution, so very high resolution of these uh, energy and water fluxes between the plant, soil, and atmosphere system. Um, uh, DGBMs have usually a strong focus on, on the photosynthesis uh, implementation, and field scale models typically have a, a much more detailed representation of what happens to, to the photosynthesis. So after, after photosynthesis, where does the carbon go and how does the plant grow? So in principle, there's a lot of capacity to, to learn from each other. Um, as you also already heard in the other talks, so running a, a crop model at the global scale requires some computation power, and it's not always uh, possible for, for everyone to, to um, have that capacity. So one thing that this phase two of TGCMI, where we did this input sensitivity analysis, aimed at was to provide like fully fledged uh, crop model emulators that are lightweight, so they can be run at basically any laptop computer. Um, they can be easily aggregated, so you can run them at the original half degree resolution, or you can aggregate the parameters already to whatever unit of simulation you are interested in, and then do the crop um, simulations for that unit. We separate rain fed and irrigated yields. Uh, we also provide emulators for the irrigation water requirements. And then in principle, these emulators can be fed with, with any climate scenario within the range of uh, not going to less than 50% of rainfall and not more than six degrees of warming. Um, but it, yeah, as you see by in the maps below, so the simulated yield and the emulated yield agree very well so it's it's a very very powerful tool to do crop model analysis in a dynamic way, without having a lot of uh, resources, uh, computation resources at your hand. We have that for um, five different crops, distinguishing wheat into spring and winter wheat, maize, rice, and soybean, and for nine different crop models. So there's also quite some diversity that people could play around with. Um, yeah, um, I, I want to stress the data uh, aspect a little bit in this talk because well, this is, uh, that's what this uh, conference is all about. So we provide a lot of data. So in principle, we already produced more than two terabytes uh, compressed binary data that, that people can find in, in different archives. And we invite everyone to, to, uh, who's interested to take a look and, and work with the data. We get our climate scenarios usually from CMIP, so thanks to them. Um, it's great to have this, this archive of climate projections uh, available, and EasyMIP currently takes care of the bias correction, so we don't have to take care of that, so that's great. But uh, as already mentioned in the beginning, um, detailed management data is a major deficiency at the global scale, and it's also a major drawback if you run crop models at that scale. Um, the other one is that you don't really have uh, the, the reference data to do a detailed calibration of your model. So basically, you have to run your model in a more or less uncalibrated way with wonky management assumptions and, and trust the results uh, that come out of it. And uh, we need to uh, close that gap a little bit. And I, I hope that this is the audience to talk to about that. And uh, Jabu, maybe we need, we need to exchange a few emails on that later on. So we, we need to expand crop models uh, by adding human decision-making, either in the model or outside the model. And if there's no management, there's no agriculture. And so we have been trying to, to fill this gap with rule-based approaches on sowing dates, on harvest dates, on where to find which tillage type, irrigation types. But there's many more aspects that need to be addressed, fertilizer, irrigation amounts, the timing of things, grassland management, pest control, you name it. 
And uh, from that, I would like to invite everyone to, to con collaborate with us. So first of all, there's all this, uh, but there's of course the opportunity to contribute with your own simulations. Uh, we always plan to have re regional activities uh, that can compare against this global scale um, data and everyone is, who, who is interested in the region can also use this global data to get, get started. Um, you can use the data for your own analysis and the patchwork family is what I want to look at and therefore I skip this slide. So there's quite a lot of data out there, but usually it doesn't come like with global coverage. So what we now do for phase three, and here's an example for soybean. On the very right hand side, you see we have data sets selected from different sources and combined them like with some uh, pretty simple rational, which of the growing seasons reported in different data sets we trust most, and then have an, uh, an ensemble of, of sets that we then provide to modelers to run their models. And I think we can do that with a lot of management assumptions. And there's also a lot of people that just know their system and that could basically in some online platform fill the gaps for their region and say, well, whatever you have here in, in Germany is really wonky, replace it with this data, provide reference or just your expert knowledge. And I think we could make a major leap forward in the global crop modeling and the management data. Um, yeah, you're invited to 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 join us. Uh, here's a few links of of the relevant uh, archives and communities, and I'm happy to answer any questions if you get in touch.